Hey guys, this is John, and today I am reviewing Modernized, The Open Sicilian by International Master Jani Bekamanov and Fide Master Kostya Kavutsky, published by Metropolitan Chess Publishing, which is a fairly recent publisher based out of Los Angeles, uh, which is where the co-authors live. And this book was sent to me by Kostya Kavutsky. He just asked me if I could review it. And since I'm reviewing books on my channel now, of, of course I agreed to do so. Uh, so here's just the a brief overview of um, the table of contents and such. And by the way, this book is massive. It clocks in at 564 pages, and it's a complete repertoire for white in the open Sicilian. So a complete repertoire for white after e4, c5, knight f3. It uh, attempts to cover all major lines, and it's a very, very thorough book. So you could buy this book if you want it as a, a one-stop shop for your open Sicilian needs from the white side and possibly even from the black side too. So here's the table of contents. Um, as you can see, the Nidor Furiation, which is basically the Cadillac of uh, black defenses in the Sicilian is front and center. And there's in fact three sub chapters dedicated to that. Um, then we move on to the Khan and Taimanov, which are kind of grouped together systems with two E6. Uh, the classical variation, Dragon, Accelerated Dragon, Sveshnikov, Kalashnikov are grouped together, and then the final chapter of the book is about minor lines like the Four Knights variation, uh, rare Sicilians. There's stuff like the O'Kelly variation there, which is e4, c5, knight f3, a6. And along the way, uh, one cool thing I like about this is they give these things called uh, memory markers. So memory markers, and here we have them, which are little diagrams at the end of each chapter and subchapter that are just meant to remind you about major themes of the lines that they show in the book. So as you can see here, like this page has four memory markers, four different diagrams featuring moves that uh, the authors felt were important. And I'll show you more about that as we get into the review. Uh, they also have exercises too, which was very helpful. So with these exercises, you can uh, solve positions that were not given in the book, but are similar in some way. And they try to use that to supplement the material that you're studying. Uh, those two things I'm alone, I'm a very big fan of in an opening book. Um, I'm not going to read to you guys the introduction, but basically, as far as I can tell, the philosophy of this book was to recommend lines for white that as much as possible can be linked to middle games. Uh, they talk about that quite a bit. They didn't really adopt like a dogmatic approach, like they're gonna try to uh, tackle the very best and sharpest lines from the white side and try to refute Black's play in the Sicilian, uh, <laughs> probably they realized that that would be a fruitless endeavor because the Sicilian is such a robust opening. Uh, but they made a lot of practical decisions and went with lines that give white playable positions that will benefit someone who has invested the time in them. Uh, and I think that's a good way to go about it in an opening book. So. Yeah, this is just a brief overview of uh, this book, and I'm going to uh, go and show you guys some of the major lines and some of their major recommendations, and just pick out a few things in the book that caught my eye. So let me switch over to the chess.com board now. If I can get my stream correct, there we go. Okay, so I went through and just mapped out the major recommendations, and let's start with their Night Elf recommendation. So, and for those of you who don't know, the open Sicilian is initiated by this move to knight f3 as white, immediately followed by d4 on move three. Okay, so this is what this book is dedicated to. Uh, now, already on move two, black has a wide choice of moves, um, and the authors cover all of them. d6, knight c6, e6, g6, even stuff like a6, all that's covered. Knight f6, I think knight f6 is covered, I could be wrong, but I would be surprised if it wasn't. Um, so let me just go through and give you an overview of the major line. So after d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, uh, the knight or variation, their recommendation was very interesting. They like h3 for white, which is a move that has uh, had kind of a uh, surge in popularity in recent years. Then they call it the Adams attack, named after uh, Weaver Adams. Um, and this move is interesting because white prepares g4. And the game can take a lot of different directions based upon how black defends. And this uh, line ha has three chapters, sub-chapters, dedicated to it in the book. Uh, one is on e6. That occupies 71 pages, after which white will respond with g4. 
and oftentimes push the F and the G pawns very aggressively. Uh, the other option for black is E5, to which the authors recommend that white should respond with knight DE2, with similar ideas, G4, bishop G2, sometimes even knight G3. This line tends to be a little more positional than E6. And the, the third subchapter is dedicated to stuff like knight C6, uh, G6 is covered, kind of like a Dragadorf type approach, moves like that. So um, I think the book will probably be judged by many people based on the recommendations in this chapter. And I'll get into one of their specific recommendations a little bit later. But uh, having looked at the material, I like the H3 variation that they give. I think there's a lot to be said about this line. And compared to lines like bishop g5 or bishop e3, which have been heavily studied and really um, deconstructed uh, quite seriously by Nidorf devotees, um, h3 is still relatively new, and there's a lot of fresh ground there. Uh, against the dragon, which is g6 on move 5, they give a pretty straightforward recommendation. They say white should play bishop e3, bishop g7, f3, castles, queen d2, knight c6. And here's a split. Uh, many people believe that bishop c4 is the way to go here, which is the Yugoslav attack. The authors say that castles is the better move. Um, or at least they say that uh, castles has been shown to be a better move in recent years. And having looked at some of the theory myself and just my general feeling about this line, I agree. I think castles is uh, emerging as a better try than the Yugoslav attack with bishop c4. Uh, from here, black has a number of options. Knight takes d4, bishop d7. d5 is the move that a lot of players will play as black as a way to try to attempt to prove that bishop c4 uh, was important and that omitting it could be uh, a problem in view of d5. And here the authors, instead of e takes d5, which is the standard move, they make an interesting recommendation. They, should, they say white should play queen e1, which maintains the tension with the pawns in the center and introduces ideas down the d-file. And this chapter, uh, I'm still going to look at it a little bit more, but it seems very interesting. Uh, it's a fresh recommendation. Um, I got the impression in going through this book that a lot of lines that they give were good lines that just hadn't been explored as much. And I know uh, Dragon players might disagree and they might be ready for this move, Queen E1, but compared to stuff like the Yugoslav attack, this particular line isn't uh, as recommended as often. It's not like uh, a mainstream recommendation, I would say, from the white side. So that's what they say white should do against the Dragon variation. Uh, against the classical Sicilian, which is knight c6 here, which many of you guys have seen that I've played, it's black on my channel. Um, instead of bishop g5, which is the Richter Rouser variation, that's a line that's considered like the key test against the classical. They make an interesting recommendation. They they like bishop c4, the so-called fischer sozin attack. And they like this because um, they say the Richter Rouser is a little too theoretically dense for their tastes. And bishop c4 is still a very legitimate alternative with white often getting a big kingside attack. And in fact, I'm gonna show you a sample of the memory markers they give from this section, just to illustrate the types of positions that uh, they try to aim for in this book. Uh, what else? They, um, they give a Shevenigan, little Shevenigan section, which is E6 on this move. And they recommend G4, no surprise there, that's the Karius attack. They actually group that under the Nidorf because it's so similar to their um, Nidorf recommendation with H3 and G4. Um, going to some other lines of the Sicilian, non-D6 lines, um, with knight C6, D4, C takes D4, knight takes D4, we have both the Kalashnikov and the Sveshnikov possible. Um, in the Kalashnikov, after E5, this kind of merges with uh, my previous book review that I did on the Killer Sicilian, which was a Kalashnikov book for black. They recommend knight B5, D6, and now this moves C4. Um, and... They say white should try to clamp down on the d5 square. Um, this is actually pretty consistent with their Sveshnikov recommendation too. I actually I haven't gone through and compared uh, Rotella's material with the suggestions of uh, Amanov and Kavutsky in this book, but it would be interesting to do so. Uh, anytime you have two theoretically uh, like serious books come out around about the same time that offer opposing views on a certain line, it's, it's always interesting to compare them. So that would be an interesting exercise to do that. Uh, like I said, in the Sveshnikov, which is knight f6 instead of e5, and then knight c3, e5, knight db5, d6, 
they recommend a positional line, bishop g5, a6, knight a3, b5, knight d5, bishop e7, and now bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, and instead of c3, which is a popular move here, c4, and they give a very enthusiastic, enthusiastic endorsement of this move. And I actually tried this move um, after kind of browsing this section of the book. I tried this in one of my standard games, which I'll show you guys a little bit later, just the snippet that I had from that game. So that's um, some coverage that they give of the 2c6, knight c6 Sicilian. And there's also e6, which can lead to con or time and off variations. And after d4, take and take, here we have a, a split. I guess the Taimanov, knight c6, they recommend the line knight c3, queen c7, and now g3. So opting for a kingside fianchetto. And after a6, bishop g2, knight f6, castles, we kind of have a tabia for this line. They say that this line is um, very challenging to the Taimanov at the moment. Um, I have to say I'm not a huge Taimanov expert, so I, I can't say uh, whether I agree with that fully. I'm going to defer to them because I'm sure they put way more work into making uh, that assessment than I did. I put in zero work in saying that. So <laughs> uh, if they said it, and I, I tend to believe them. So um, their con recommendation, I do play the con as black, so I feel a little bit more inclined to uh, give my opinion about that. But the con is initiated after A6. And they say something very interesting in this section. And I really like the honesty that Amanov and Kavutsky display in this book. So I'm just going to read to you what they say about their recommendation after A6. So this is quoting from page 154. They say, like most major Sicilians, the con variation is a reliable choice for black as it is theoretically sound and offers good chances for counterplay. In the interest of being forthright, our recommendation against this opening is not considered to be critical by theoretical standards. Instead, the line we've selected will involve white launching a do or die kingside attack with the main goal being checkmate. While we believe the attack is both sound and dangerous, dangerous, it will give black serious counter chances on the queen side. And the line that they ultimately recommend is knight c3, queen c7, and g3. It's similar to their time and off recommendation in a way involving the king side fianchetto, knight f6 and bishop g2. Um, as a con player, I've never found this to be that dangerous. Uh, one idea is bishop b4, trying to inconvenience black a little bit, uh, white a little bit, and make them defend the knight on c3, either with bishop d2 or knight d back to e2. But that comment that they made about this uh, really struck me as a pretty awesome one for an opening book, because they're basically saying, hey, we're not going to try to refute this opening. We're going to give you a good practical weapon that we're going to explore in depth, and you can run with it. And they, um, they don't pull any punches. They say that black will get counterplay on the queen side. You know, so <laughs> they're being very honest about their assessment of this line and their recommendation. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, other lines that they give, uh, there's the accelerated dragon. So with knight c6, whoops, not mean to do that, sorry. Um, just try to skip around to the variation question. So the accelerated dragon is initiated after knight c6 on move two, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, g6. And against this, instead of knight c3, which would be pretty consistent with an open Sicilian repertoire, they actually recommend white go for the Meroxy bind with c4. And one variation that I was curious about, because I've always felt was kind of a problem for white in this line in recent years, uh, they address just right away, they address the line after knight f6, knight c3, d6, bishop e2, knight takes d4, queen takes d4, Bishop g7, Bishop e3, castle. And now since this knight can now jump and initiate a discovered attack on the white queen, uh, white wants to retreat the queen with queen d2. And now after a5, this is the line that I personally for the past few years have felt gives white some issues. The idea for black is to go a4 and then queen a5. And black has good space on the queen side. Um, it's a real play to restrict this queen side majority that white has. But Amanov and Kavutsky give a, a convincing line, I think. They say rook d1 is a good move here, with the main idea being that if a4, white can respond with c5, exploiting the pin on the d-file and attacking the d6 pawn three times. So therefore, black should play bishop e6. And then after castles a4, they give the move f4 an exclamation point. 
And then after queen a5, they say bishop d4. And to quote from the book, um, this move exerts pressure along the long diagonal. And in some cases, bishop takes f6 and knight d5 will be a strong idea. And bishop d4 also prepares queen e3, I assume as a way to uh, get out of the potential x-ray of the knight on c3 and maybe prop up moves like you know e5 or f5 or whatnot. So that was a variation that I was curious about and I was able to open right to the section and there was the answer that I hadn't uh, looked at seriously over the past couple of years, but I knew to be something challenging to white and they say right away what white should do against it. So that's a recommendation against the accelerated dragon. Uh, let me just run through and see if I'm missing anything else that they talk about. Uh, like I said, there's some space devoted to uh, random stuff like A6, uh, the O'Kelly variation, um, other stuff like knight C6, D4, C takes D4, knight takes D4, knight F6, knight C3, and E6. This is a line that gets played every once in a while, and they recommend knight DB5. So that is just a general overview of the lines. And again, you can go back and take a look at the table of contents if you're, if you're curious about that. Uh, next thing I want to do, I want to look at a few examples of the exercises and memory markers that they show. And here is an example of one of the exercises that they give. This is taken from the dragon section. And this is a game Ivanov versus Wrench. <laughs> so uh, you guys know Danny Wrench of chess.com. He was the victim in this particular position playing black against Alexander Ivanov. And it's white to move. And they say, white to move and win. How should white play? If you want to try to solve it yourself, you can pause the recording. Okay, so the move is e5. Strong move and a typical idea in the dragon. The point is, if black takes on e5, white has g5. And because there's a queen rook attack on the bishop on d7, this knight is driven away, black will just lose that piece. So therefore, in the game, after e5, Danny did not take the pawn. He played knight back to e8, but this allowed knight d5, attacking the queen, also hitting the e7 pawn. And after queen d8, bishop g5, Ivanov unleashed a brutal attack. He's now threatening to take on e7 again, maybe this time even with the bishop if he gets a chance, or knight takes king h8, knight takes g6 check, winning the queen. So therefore, black played f6, trying to... Uh, blunt the bishop, but Ivanov now played knight takes f6 check. Notice that queen d5 check is now a possibility because this diagonal is opened up. So Danny did not even take the knight. He played king h8. And here Ivanov continued in fine style. He played h5, headhunting the black king. Now the rook on h1 is eager to get at the pawn on h7. So h5, uh, black took on f6 h takes g6. Here, Danny tried to shore up the a2 g8 diagonal with bishop e6. Otherwise, bad stuff could happen. For instance, uh, f takes g5, rook takes h7 check, king g8, queen d5 with mate to come. So bishop e6 was played instead. But then after rook takes h7 check, king g8, queen h2, black was in serious trouble because white is threatening Rook h8 check, bishop takes h8, queen h7. So Danny played queen e7, but after rook h1, he unfortunately had to resign because there's no defense to rook h8 check, bishop takes h8, and now queen takes h8 with mate. So this one little exercise snippet, uh, in my opinion, showed about, I don't know, probably three or four different themes that crop up uh, in the dragon that both white and black need to be aware of, specifically this e5 and g5 idea if black takes the pawn, and also initiating an attack against the e7 pawn and attacking down the h file too. So these exercises are great supplements to the material. I really like when opening books do this because they don't just give you lines that you're supposed to just memorize. They try as much as possible to make it interactive, make you use your brain, and not just sit there passively absorbing the lines. Um, and also they give you worthwhile material for the middle game too. This is already a middle game. This is something, if you were to play the recommendations, you might as well get, you, you very well could get. Um, another example of an exercise I liked, this is from the Accelerated Dragon section. This is a game, uh, Julio Granda Zuniga versus Steven Gordon. 
from 2013. Another thing I like about this book is like all of the examples, uh, a lot of the examples I, I should say are very new. Um, lots of stuff from 2012, 2013, 2014. Some older games too, but much of the material is uh, from this millennium. So this is from the Accelerated Dragon section, as I said. It is white to move. So how can white gain the advantage in this position? You can pause your recording if you like. Okay, so Meroxy positions like we have here differ a lot from normal open Sicilian positions and they require some subtle handling. And here the move is bishop g3, idea being to take out this strong dark square bishop. And since white is threatening bishop takes e5, d takes e5, queen takes c5, Gordon decided to play the knight back to d7. And here Granda Zuniga, which is who's a very strong grandmaster, uh, played the move rook takes d6 sacrificing the exchange. And after uh, bishop takes d6, bishop takes d6, white was only down one point of material, but he obtained complete mastery of the dark squares. And according to Amanov and Kavutsky, white has a clear advantage here. So this in itself is almost a memory marker, even though this was under the exercise section, because um, it, at least to me, it triggers um, a memory of this line that White should try to get rid of black strong dark square bishop, which usually is on g7, but in this case it has come to c to e5 in order to protect the d6 pawn. And white can do that with bishop g3. So destabilizing e5 and in turn destabilizing the pawn on d6. Next, let me show you an example of the memory markers that they give. Now I'm going to take these from the section on the classical Sicilian, where they recommended that Fisher Sozin attack. So here's the first memory marker they give at the end of this chapter. Um, the only thing I don't like about the memory markers is they give the position as a diagram after the move has been played. So they don't actually show this diagram, but uh, the move in question, which is f4, which is meant to be a trigger for you that f4, f5, they say hammering away at the a2, g8 diagonal, as occurred in the game Fisher versus Cardozo. Um, so they, they give this position right here after f4 has been played. Um, I think it might have been more useful for them to give this position before the move and ask you to like uh, find the best move for white. But they give this one and they say, white has just played f4 with the idea hammering away at the a2 g8 diagonal. Still a useful thing and kind of a, a minor nitpick, but I think that's something maybe they can improve upon for future books. Uh, another example from this section of a memory marker is this position. Here again, I have chosen to uh, not make the move yet, but it's white to move. And the memory marker position that they give is this one after knight e4. They say the knight heads to d6, creating a dangerous pass pawn if black were to capture. And they give a, a reference to a game that was discussed. It was short versus Kasparov. So they give you a reference point that you can refer to, back to from the chapter. Uh, let's look at one more from the same chapter. This position, uh, white to move. The move is bishop f4, placing pressure on the d6 pawn, and according to them, forcing black to play knight e5. This is from the game Kasparov versus Anand, is the reference they give. And black has to play knight e5, and they also give another memory marker, by the way, shortly thereafter, after bishop e2, and I think the move is a6 now, and then g4. This is given as another memory marker position. So I'm a big fan of that. I think the book goes up in value because it gives so many exercises and memory markers uh, throughout the book. It's really a book you can interact with rather than just uh, learn from passively. Uh, finally, wrapping up this review, I'm just going to give you a quick example of how difficult it is to write a book like this. Um, so shortly after this book came out, um, there was a game played in Jerusalem between um, Grandmasters Grigory Oparin and Sergei Zagolko. Oparin is 2550 and Zagolko is uh, 2675. And it featured one of the positions that Amanov and Kavutsky give as their recommendation for white against the Nyorf. And I'm just going to show you the moves leading up to it. So it's with the h3 move once again, and then e6, g4. Bishop e7, g5, knight fd7, h4. There's a lot of positions like this in the book where they recommend pushing the kingside pawns for white. b5, 
a3, bishop b7. Notice the importance of a3 stopping black from playing b4 and kicking the knight away. Bishop e3. And now knight b6. This move, knight b6, is um, not exactly a footnote in their book, but they don't allocate that much coverage to it. They say white should continue with f4, which they give an exclam. Now here, um, this just shows you how quickly modern theory can change and why writing a book trying to tackle everything is impossible. Um, which I don't believe they did, by the way. I think they did a good job of keeping uh, things in perspective. But here, Amanov and Kavutsky only give the move knight 8 d7 for black, which, to their credit, has only been the only move played up until the point this book was published a month or two ago. And then after f5, white develops a very nice position. Knight c5, f takes e6, f takes e6, queen g4, hitting the e6 pawn, queen c8, castles queenside, Notice white's pretty sizable lead in development right now. Um, castle short, and now this move, knight takes e6, which uh, apparently works out for white because of the weak knight on b6. Like if black were to play knight takes e6, bishop takes b6 as possible, uh, or queen takes e6 first, you can trade the queens and then take on b6. So that's all well and good, but unfortunately this Oparin versus Zhigolko game um, black played the move knight a4 on move 12. So after f4, instead of the knight a d7 move that Amanov and Kavutsky give, black played knight a4, which, by the way, is uh, the main recommendation of the engine. Uh, and after knight takes a4, the idea is not to recapture right away, but play what Zhigolko did, which was bishop takes e4, counterattacking the rook on h1. Um, it's kind of funny because I was looking at this line with a student of mine, um, and I was telling my student about the Amanov and Kavutsky recommendation here for white. And my student is a big Nador fan for black. And he immediately asked me like what they have against this line. And we were looking at it. And uh, we found this uh, Oparin versus Zhigolko game where black played net a4. And we both agreed that it looked kind of scary for both sides and altogether unclear. And I think at times the computer actually prefers black in the complications here. Um, the Oparin game, by the way, white played knight takes b5 and all hell broke loose. Um, so my student and I were discussing this and I was like, oh, that's an interesting finding. We gotta, I got to put this in the book review. And then I was on uh, chesspublishing.com today um, and I saw a thread devoted to modernize the open Sicilian, this book. And uh, in that thread, they discuss knight a4. And it seems like they, um, the authors might have known about knight a4, but took it out for space, space considerations. You might want to go read the thread and check it out, but this is just an example of how quickly modern theory changes. Um, I mean, it's impossible to write a book like this and cover everything. You can get close and you can do as best a job as you can, but you're never, ever going to find every little detail and proven advantage in every single line. So just keep that in perspective as you're reviewing it. Like I, I would not knock the authors at all for missing something like this, unless it was pretty glaring, like a pretty glaring omission, but... Uh, this Oparin Zhigalko game was played after the book was already published, so how are they to know that <laughs> this was going to be a critical test? So this looks to be the most serious move in this line, and unfortunately one little twist like that can change the entire evaluation. Like maybe that line with knight a4 becomes the principal way that uh, black should play against h3. You know, it's very well possible. We'll have to wait and see. This game was played less than a month ago. Uh, now, one of my personal findings... This is just something kind of fun. So on uh, March 25th, just a few days ago, I played a game um, in the 15-minute pool on ICC. And those of you guys who follow uh, my standard playlist will have already seen this game. But I put one of the recommendations to the test in that game. So I was white. And I don't often play E4, but I was kind of psyched up about this book and willing to try it. So my opponent went into the Sveshnikov variation with E5. And I followed the Imanov and Kavutsky recommendation. Knight db5, d6, bishop g5, a6, knight a3, b5, knight d5, bishop e7, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6. Now here, in the past, I have usually played c3 myself, which is a pretty restrained way of playing. White makes way for the knight to come back to c2 and coming over to e3. But um, inspired by uh, modernized the open Sicilian, I actually played their recommendation c4 which they give an enthusiastic endorsement of, uh, trying to clamp down on the d5 square and also make this pawn on b5 move. Now, 
Um, I only was aware of the move b4 here, which is the main line, b4, knight c2, after which a somewhat closed position can arise. Um, but my opponent played the move queen a5 check instead, which was not something I was aware of at all. And I played the game and uh, did the analysis, and I was talking about whether queen a5 check was possible, and I was wondering if like I had missed it in the book or something. Um, so later, uh, I went back and looked at it, and the authors do cover this move. They say queen a5 is dubious, and they give a line similar to what happened in the game. In the game, I played queen d2, queen takes d2 check, king takes d2. Now, black's problem is that knight c7 check forks the king and the rook, and there's also the threat of taking on b5. So therefore, my opponent threw in bishop g5 check, I played king d1, castles, c takes b5, knight d4, so black is sacrificing a pawn. And here, I'd been following their recommendation up till this point. I played the move h4, attacking the bishop, and um, it was a complicated game for the next few moves especially, and I eventually won. But the authors say that simpler is b takes a6, bishop takes a6, bishop takes a6, rook takes a6, and now knight c2. And uh, they cite a grandmaster game and say that white is uh, somewhat better here. So I just love the fact that I, I can put a, a recommendation of theirs into practice, and even when an obscure move pops up, it's still there, and I can look it up and see what uh, they say. Um, you know, a lot of books do that, but um, some books miss moves that, like, over the board might look reasonable. Um, by the way, I don't know why. <laughs> For some reason, chess.com is not displaying the pawn on d6. Sometimes the chess.com board kind of messes up like that, but there is a black pawn on d6. But um, I guess what I'm saying is I just like their completeness and their uh, drive to try to get uh, sub variations in as well. Because over the board, I mean, a move like queen a5 check like might look like a reasonable try instead of b4, which is the main move. Oh, there, there's the pawn back on d6. <laughs> uh, so that's just one of uh, my experiences with the lines that they recommend. I'm going to keep trying some of the lines that they that they endorse for white. So that is about it. I um, I definitely recommend this book. I think if you play the Open Sicilian as white, you'll find many interesting things about this. And also, if you have a favorite variation from the black side, you might pick up some useful knowledge as well. And at, at the very least, you'll know what to expect because. As always, when a big work comes out like this, uh, you tend to see an increase in the number of times these lines are played. So that's about it for me. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comments. I'm going to tell uh, Kostya Kabutsky about this review, of course, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up in the comments to answer any questions. So thank you guys for watching, and I don't know what my next re review will be on. Um, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. If you're a publisher out there, send me a free book and I'll review it. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Talk to you later.